Do you miss playing live? I do. Did you know I played in China? I saw pictures, yeah. but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, I it, and that was like I was like, how did this find me? Yeah. Because it was our the director at our school. Um, like I just meant uh, we were out at the bar. There's a bar like right across from the school, and um, that's where everyone would end up. Mm-hmm. And um, she she's the type of person where she just brings her guitar and she'll just start playing and people start singing and and of course I was like. Hey, I know some songs, and so I sat down. I think I did. I wasn't on the guitar. I just sang "What's Up." Okay, right? and everyone loved it. Of course, they know that song over there, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, most of my colleagues were Canadian. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. So, um, yeah. So then after that, she, like it, it piqued her interest, and she was just like, "Hey, you know, you want to jam sometime?" And I was like, "Sure." Like, okay. So then I'd go to her office. Uh, like once a week and and just sing I think there were a few Amy Winehouse songs that I was Ooh. like oh, you know I've been playing playing them at home on my couch yeah and uh, why don't we do that did they and want acoustic then, or mandolin from you hmm? did you play mandolin or acoustic guitar? I didn't have my mandolin okay and acoustic. and I didn't I didn't look into getting I, sh- I could have yeah but um yeah and so it went from that to to um her talking with other musicians that were on staff and and then we played at Chinese New Year. We had like a um, a banquet, and we played one song. No, we played two. I sang Amy Winehouse. Which song did I sing? Um, shoot, I can't. Was it a big hit? Of I hers? could sing it. <laughs> but Is it uh, Back to Black? I'm no good. Uh, I'm I'm no good. Okay. Yeah, that's a good that song. It. Yeah. Um, but then, so we just had one. Did one thing last year, and then this year. Like they were all about. They're like, let's practice once a week, mm-hmm. and we did. And we had a set uh, set list of twelve, and we played at the Hard Rock over there. Oh, that's it sweet. was really cool. Um, so I found myself on tambourine a lot. Like okay. I, you know, in life, I figure I I take myself as the et cetera person. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'll kind of feel it. Like even in soccer, it was like people always ask, like, "Well, what'd you play?" And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> everything other than." goalie you know forward during the summer in high school it was uh in high school it was forward midfield with this team defense with this team so you're like the utility player yeah okay i just kind of go where i'm needed so then like you know (laughs) and and when we played yeah you know i'd go where 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 i was needed this song needs a cowbell okay (laughs) pull out a cowbell somewhere that i remember we had that what song was that on um Um, stuck in the middle maybe or maybe oh yeah Yep. I got to do that once, and it was so exciting. Cowbell's fun. Yes, it was awesome. Especially because you could take your aggression zone out, and, and no matter how hard you hit it, it's okay. Yeah, it's still cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like playing drums sometimes. You could kind of bash away. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so so um, I played the tambourine a lot, but, um, you know, saying what's up. Mm-hmm. And uh, what else? I was on bass for, like, two or three songs. Now, I was playing it's very basic. The, basic bass. Basic bass, bass yeah. But um, that's all you need. Oh my gosh, I was like thrilled because they were like, "Oh, this song, we should, we're not gonna do this." You know, we don't have ba- we really need bass for this mm-hmm. song. Wait, what and song I'm like, was it? I will. <laughs> can <laughs> I, I can do can it? I? Um, which song? Um, there were three. <clears throat> um, reggae woman. Oh wow. Um, and again, basic. Sure. Um, it's got some sweet bass lines though. Yeah. Um, the guy that came in after me. Um, that joined later in the year, and he'll be with them next year. Mm. Uh, he can play. I was just like, do 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 do. <laughs> Were you kind of mad when he joined? Well, it, it kind of took away from you know, like I, I had to give up a lot of the songs that I was working on sure. with bass. But I, you know, inside I was like, oh, like I just, I was a little jealous. But then I'm like, but he's better than me. Mm. So. But you're probably way better looking than him. I'm just guessing. Depends on who. <laughs> Was he, a man, was he a man hunk? <laughs> no, not in my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> Sometimes that's really an important thing in a band, you know, how the band looks, if it's a cool look. And yeah. I know a lot of people who hire people that look cool that play basic versus being great players and maybe mm-hmm. they look like they should be in their basement playing or something. Mm-hmm. But it sounds mean, but <laughs> sometimes people want an image more. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you definitely see that on you know the boy bands and whatnot yeah and especially when they're not really playing live they're just playing to a recording track recorded track and you yeah. could tell because they're not plugged in or something yeah that's so embarrassing that's terrible but you're playing bass i 
picture you holding a base. Was it um? It, was it one of your bases, or did you have to buy one? Or? Uh, they had they had extras. Okay. Uh, it, I mean, it was cool because since it's, you know, we're all it's it's a school. Mm-hmm. You know, it's our school. It's um, kindergarten through <coughs> grade twelve. Um, and they have a music program. They had, you know, extra basses. They had ukuleles sitting around. They had pianos, you know, piano rooms. Um, I didn't utilize those enough. <laughs> you know, I, I, I went in a few times, but, you know, got busy. Um, yeah, can, so they had a lot of stuff. I could see you playing a guitar for some reason. That I haven't tried that. Oh, that'd be sweet. You know what's on my bucket list? I, I still need to get back to my banjo that's collecting dust mm-hmm. at my dad's house. Mm-hmm. But um, um, the... Accordion Ooh. would be so cool. I, I mean, that looks it's very complicated. Yeah. Have you tried it? Well, I was recording Michael Lott's last album, mm. and it needed something. And I like Counting Crows, and a lot of their early stuff has a lot of accordion in it. Yeah. So my student's mom brought me an accordion. She's like, we just had this in the basement or something. Here, try oh it. Oh, my gosh. And I just messed with it. And I was like, oh, it makes sense all of a sudden. You pull it and you hold a button and it makes yeah. a certain chord progression. And then I kind of know the keys, so it kind of made sense. Yeah. I was able to lay some stuff down. Yeah. So you uh-huh. could do it if you know a little basic piano, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, talk about growing dendrites in my brain. Yeah, what's that? Dendri- like when you learn something new. Yeah, and you, like now like, for me, I'm learning something new. What? It, oh, you mean with the accordion? No, or dendrites. What? I never De- knew. Oh, dendrites. Yes, okay. dendri- you're growing dendrites about dendrites. Isn't that ironic? Um, yeah, no, it, I mean, that's just, um, you know, when you learn something new, it's, it's, you make a new connection in your brain. And then the more you practice, of course, the stronger it gets. Okay. So, um, yeah. Are I there mean, other words for that? Because people always say den- dendrites, uh, synap- not synaps- uh, synap- okay. synapses. They say that. Um, but I feel like those are two different parts connnecting neurons or something, and all of it. I've I, never heard that word before. That's so oh, crazy. Oh, now you're making me die. <laughs> Where's my Google? <laughs> I'll look it up later. Dundrites. Okay. Yeah. Well, no matter what, I feel like I'm learning something, so that's good. Yeah. Part good. of this podcast has been I've been learning a lot of cool. Like yesterday I had my singer for the heart band, tribute mm-hmm. band, and she has, she's a scientist, so she kept saying stuff like habituate. No, she was saying words I didn't really understand the context she was using mm-hmm. them, but I was kind of nodding my head. Yeah. You know, so it's a fun way to learn. Mm-hmm. Plus, I admit when I'm stupid about something or I try to. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of words I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, <laughs> My it, dad's really good with pointing that out. Mm, like grammatical errors, too? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I do my best. I mean, I teach children, so I mm-hmm. I know the basics of that. But um, My friend's mom used to correct me all the time when I'd say, me and Matt are going. She'd oh. say, Matt and I yeah. are going. And she would stop <laughs> me. and like, ooh. I've, so I, I learned from her. I've broken myself of those some of those habits mm-hmm. but um there definitely are i can't think of any right now but you know it's funny because um when i get into reading certain books all of a sudden i'll be talking to my friends not even about the book and i'll say a word and i'm like where did that come mm-hmm. from you just like that it, was yeah. the first time i used that word mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, it happens. It's almost like yeah. you store them away, and then they come out at the right time. Yeah, but I, I, I totally notice it. Like when I get, when I'm really, you know, I'm reading every night. Mm-hmm. You know, because sometimes I get in that habit. You know, reading ten anywhere from ten minutes to forty minutes a night before bedtime. Um, and yeah, it's it's. I surprise myself. Yeah. Because I'm like, wow, that sounded really smart. smart. <laughs> Do you ever say the word wrong because you're only reading it at the time, or um, do you look it up? And, yes, that has happened. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'm really bad with idioms. Mm. Do you know idioms? No. Like where, um, and we teach this to our little kids. I'm an idiom idiot. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like idiom. I'm sure I know what it is somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you use idioms, I'm sure. Like, so, uh, well, let me give you a, an example. So um, there was one day where my, my first graders were just kind of a bit crazy, crazier than usual and I'm bringing them outside for recess and the principal's standing there and I'm like oh my gosh today it's like I'm herding cattle and I looked at him and I was like that wasn't right was it and he's like no <laughs> and I'm like what is it like it wasn't coming to me he's like like herding cats mm. so idioms are you know like phrases that really don't make sense right but okay they, they, um, um, is it like an analogy in a weird way? Maybe. Okay. There's 
no, if I could think, you know, raining, raining cats and dogs. I think that's an idiom. Okay. Man, I haven't. I, We're going to have a lot of Googling to do I yeah. think, after this. Should I look up the definition while you're <laughs> Yes, of please it? do. Idiom. But anyways, I, I, I sometimes get them all mixed up. And I, yeah, my dad, of course, he's the first one to hear it come out wrong. Sure. And he's like, nah, that's not right. And is he a pretty smart dude? Yeah, he is. He reads a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a group of words established by yeah. usage as having a meaning not deduct yep. deductible from <laughs> those of the individual words. Yeah. Example, raining cats and dogs. Yeah. Oh, they have that in there. And see the light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of things I don't know I mean, as far as English goes. I've been watching Little House on the Prairie again. Mm -hmm. And this one guy is like, you're splitting infinitudes or something, infinite oh. somethings. I'm like, I never knew that was a rule, let alone what it means. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Infinitudes? I think that was the word. Because a, a, a lady, Harriet Olson, was trying to submit an article to the town paper. Mm -hmm. And he she thought she was such a good writer. And he said that to her. And she, saw, she was so deflated. She didn't even know what that meant. Either, so <laughs> I didn't feel too bad. <laughs> but I guess teaching, you have to kind of know that stuff now. Yeah. Is it annoying? Like, do I really need to know no, all this? No, like, um, I mean, I've taught lower primary mostly, but there was one year that I taught fifth grade. Mm. And I had to learn, I had to, I had to learn math that I couldn't remember learning, but I probably did, or I didn't learn it. Mm. They taught me it. Okay. Um, and I, I mean... The second time around, I got it. Of course, I was an adult, mm -hmm. but math was really difficult for me. And, uh, you know, I always just kind of shrug my shoulders and I'm just like, I'm just not good at math. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I just wasn't ready for it. Yeah. A lot of people aren't. Yeah. They're cramming algebra at people like sixth grade or something. Mm -hmm. and, and Romeo and Juliet, and they're throwing all this stuff at these little minds. And I'm wondering... Is that some sort of weird thing just to kind of test us to see if we're stupid or are they trying to fill our brains with things so early we just get confused or what do you think it is? I think I, uh, that's a big topic. Yeah, I just talked to um, Bobby about you know, this actually. I, uh, they, I mean, they keep pushing uh, curriculum down, you know, from, from the upper grades. They keep pushing it down. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think we have like pressure to compete with the other – other countries and I mean I guess just locally other schools and other districts and um, you know there's of course the pressure of all the tests mm -hmm. standardized tests and um, which have been proven to be sort of detrimental I think to certain kids yeah right? yeah and yeah I mean it's it's not fair to take one test and um, that's kind of put that label on the the child, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, some, some kids or adults just aren't good at sitting down and taking a test like that, you know, or just sitting it, down and yeah, paying attention. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's hard to put everyone in the same box. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all different. <laughs> yeah. When you say box, it scares me because it almost seems like they take your brain and turn it into a box yeah. and it has to fit everything yeah. else. And it seems like the most successful people I know in my life are people who basically sucked at school and they found something afterwards that mm -hmm. they really loved. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's that battle of you could either conform and follow everything that they show you or yeah. you can see it as a springboard in which to take things from, but also say, I don't want to do that shit. I'm over here now. Mm -hmm. You know, like try to work your way to something you're actually passionate about. Because yeah. I know people that follow the rules all the way up until they're in their mid fifties, then they go crazy. Right. And then they finally like lose all the pressure and go, Oh my God, I was brainwashed my whole life. Yeah. But, you know. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot that needs to be changed. And it's like, it's hard to figure out where to start, yeah. you know, like it's such a big there, problem. Like it that. is. And, and, um, first off, who's, you keep saying they <laughs> are pushing, who's they is it some they, overlords? Gosh, or <laughs> I, you know, I mean, uh, they they would go up to, I mean, anywhere from the superintendents in our school districts to the state, you know, like we've got standards and mm -hmm. um, curriculum that we're supposed to follow and cover. And I mean, I, I mean, I think 
some guidance and structure is definitely needed. Sure. You know, so in one district, all these kids are learning this and getting this enrichment and these great lessons and kids in another district never even get, you know, those lessons mm -hmm. or they never even learn about that aspect. So, I mean, it's definitely needed. It's just, um, I think, the overall structure of, um, I mean, how... Like, I, I don't know, like the opportunities and what we encourage our kids to <clears throat> um, pursue. Yeah, pursue it. I know what you mean, because yeah. some parents, their scope is so small that they would never tell their kid to rise above that, whereas other yeah. parents push so hard. It's this weird, it's got to be hard as a teacher to see, hey, this student's mom really pushes her, her to be top notch, mm -hmm. but this other kid's parents don't care at all mm -hmm. so he doesn't really try but you still hear about people who are have all this adversity and they still make it somehow mm -hmm. so i wonder if it's some bell curve thing or something no matter what you throw at certain people they're gonna make it other people just have a harder time getting there i yeah. don't know what it is yeah i mean I, yeah i think a lot of it does come to like the opportunity that's given to them yeah right some some have parents that I mean, maybe they push them to just do what the parents think they need to do. Sure. But, you know, other parents that encourage them to pursue um, what they're interested in, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's music or sports or um, art. Um, I think I think it's all about um, helping the child develop into, like, well-rounded and let them find their way. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's... At least give them a chance to do it versus forcing them mm. or not giving to them at yeah. all, probably. And, and with the way that the educational system is at this point, it mm -hmm. kind of has to be done after school, mm -hmm. unless Isn't you're um, unless you're in like. So there are some schools that really are that that know what what the kids need, mm -hmm. you know, and they find ways around it to still uh, give those children an oppor opportunities. You know, so they're not all the same. You know, some schools, some districts figure it out. And it's it's just really too bad that we don't get an opportunity to um, talk with those, to, to get dialogue going on yeah. between those districts or those schools. Like, we in the, in the education community, we hear about these awesome schools or, like, these awesome teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's all. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear about it and we're like, oh my gosh, they get an wouldn't award that be and great? That's it. Yeah. But I, there, there needs to be some seriousness put behind um, figuring out what to change, how to change it. And I don't know. I have my opinions, but hmm. I, I don't know. You know, well, I don't have the answers either. But I, I wonder, like, it seems the just the structure of it's wrong or something for example learning in a big group there are mm -hmm. advantages to it but i think technology is going to take care of that <coughs> where being in a group is more about socializing and seeing what other people are all about that's cool mm -hmm. we need that but actually learning i think it's going to be a little more personal in the future mm -hmm. because let's say you're in a group of 10 people and you want to be the best roller uh, roller derby person mm -hmm. ever but nine of them can't even skate yet Mm -hmm. So you're sort of like, okay, I guess I wait for these people. And everybody sort of comes to this middle ground. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's good for everybody. Whereas if you just had your own coaching and you could go as far as you could, it seems like that would be better on an individual basis. And then mm -hmm. those people below would find a way up on their own as well versus trying to just slow you down or feel bad because they're slowing you down. Yeah. Or feeling like, hey, she's so far ahead. I'm never going to get there. I might as well not try. There's so many weird group yeah. things that happens. You know? And in, in the... In the classroom as, as a teacher, I mean, you have to think about, we call it differentiating. So, you know, we know that all the kids are different. Yeah. You know, they have different learning styles. They they have different interests. Mm -hmm. They have different levels of understanding, whether it's um, reading or math or, um, and so we try. <laughs> yeah. It's very difficult though, as being one person and, you know, in the public schools, that's all you have is yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you might get an, an EA, you know, education, educational assistant. Um, but for the most part, you're kind of, uh, when it's class time, you're kind of on your own and you're just trying to juggle all the differentiating, the different 
options that you give the kids right. in addition to behavior, classroom management, which is Yeah, we didn't even talk big. about behavior. So you're trying to wrangle the cats? Uh, oh, yeah. The or the cattle. <laughs> so, yeah. So it gets to the point, though, where you still have to push the curriculum, right? They still have to yeah. pass these tests. Yeah. So no matter what you try to do with each student, they eventually all have to get to that middle level, I believe. Yeah. So maybe that's the problem is we're trying to make everyone mm. the same. Mm. And I don't know. It's like, like colleges, it seems like everyone's trying to send their kids to Ivy League colleges because they think they're all geniuses. But what mm. if one kid wants to be a plumber? I yeah. mean, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Trade schools, I think, are picking up again because of mm-hmm. all this craziness. So, Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of it starts at home. You know, even if the, the kids go to a strict school that just teaches the, you know, no enrichment, just here's math, mm-hmm. here's reading. Um, at home, you know, if they have parents that um, show them everything, out, you know, here's the world, mm-hmm. look at this. And sure, they support their work at school, right? Okay, let's make sure you understand this in math. You didn't get this the other day. But, um, you know, open their eyes to everything else. And, um, you know, as teachers, I mean, we we do our best to raise good children in our class. But we, we really, I mean, it's, I see the most success with my students when the parents are supportive, they communicate with the teacher with concerns, um, you know, they, they are positive with their kids, mm-hmm. but at the same time they have uh, expectations and boundaries. Realistic, ex- not just yeah. my kid's perfect. Yeah, um, yeah, they understand mistakes are okay. Mm-hmm. You know, mistakes, the, especially, uh, I mean, they're kids, you know. Yeah. They're um, this year. I was teaching grade one, and um, I had a lot of meetings with parents about behaviors. And it wasn't meetings that I always set up, mm-hmm. but sometimes the parents would call in and say, "This is happening, and we need to talk about this now." Hmm. And um, like what? Um, oh gosh, let's see. Like issues, it's almost always issues on the playground, you know, because it's unstructured time. And so um, in the classroom, they kind of know what they should be doing, where they should be going. Um, At recess, you know, they're they're learning, they're they're playing and learning how to socialize. And so... It's the uh, prison yard. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Sorry, I'm really Uh, harsh on school. They they usually have smiles on their face out there. Okay. I check. All right. (laughs) But... uh, I picture you with binoculars standing at the window. Well, and sure this cool. year my my windows faced. I was right next to the playground. Okay. And actually, um, when I was back in Minnesota, um, I also had the view of playground. So oh, nice. <laughs> so often, actually, I would see something going on. I'd open my window and be like, "Hey, hey, stop that!" <laughs> <laughs> you, like I don't even get a break, you know, because I'm. Oh I'm my watching god! You're trying to says, grade papers and yeah. you see some kid hanging a kid off from yeah. his foot off the playground. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, it's it's nonstop. But that's a, an important part, too, I guess, is let the kids go to this playground yeah. where the teacher's not really watching most of the time and see what see how you come out. Yeah. But wow. but about the parents, though. So yeah. um, with the meetings, uh, especially this year, um, I, I, I was teaching in China mm-hmm. this year and, and last year. And um, a lot of the parents would come in with, you know, major concerns about, about the behavior and, you know, or... Um, you know, mistakes that they're making, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Um, you know, like not being a good friend to their friends, you know, like calling names on the playground or um, pushing someone, they fall down and uh, first grade kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I had already talked to the child about it and, you know, okay, like, tell me what happened. What was the choice that you made? Mm-hmm. How did this affect others? Um, I also, in the meetings, tell the parents, this is the time that this is the very important time in your child's life where they're going to learn. They're either going to learn or they're not, like, how to be a good person. Yeah. And so, and I tell the parents that because often they, they'll be angry and often angry at their child where, okay, you I know, they're... They, you. No, well, they sometimes are, but... Are, but I chill them out. (laughs) Yeah, you deflect it. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it's 
almost always when parents come in and they're upset, it's they're concerned for their child's well-being, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I just tell them that it's good that they're making the mistakes because these will be lessons that hopefully if we handle them correctly and they, we don't shame them about it mm -hmm. or um, they... They'll, they'll remember it. I remember some of my lessons, actually, when I was a little girl. Let me tell you. So grade one, you know, you start spelling tests. And I had Mrs. Hagerness, and she was really nice. It's funny how we always remember our elementary school teachers' names. Yeah. I remember all of them. Yep. I had I had some pretty good teachers. Um, so we had spelling tests on Fridays, and I, I was probably nervous for it. I, I worried a lot. And I can remember the night before studying my words and my dad's like, he, he's helping me with them. And he's like, well, glance at your words, glance at them beforehand. But I didn't understand what he meant by beforehand. Mm -mm. So the next day, I can I, I've, got, I've got on my desk, I can remember <laughs> seeing it. I have my paper sitting there. I write my name. She, I, she says the word. On my lap underneath my desk, I kept my list you because I was glancing at it mm -hmm. like my dad told me. Yeah. So when she saw that, what I was doing, she said, oh, no. <laughs> She's like, you can't do that. That's cheating. And I can remember thinking, what? Mm -hmm. What's that? Like, And I'm like, I told her. My dad told me I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had permission. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know she ever like told my dad about that. But um, <laughs> I I remember the, the, the small epiphany that it was. Mm -hmm. Being like, oh, that's cheating. Yeah. Like, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. What uh, grade was that? Grade one. Oh, okay. I also, I also have another one. So my parents used to work out at, um, oh, something swim and racket club. U.S. Swim and Fitness. I don't know. It was in Brooklyn Center. Yep. Yeah? It used okay. to be called U.S. And then it changed to. They changed it a few times. Yeah. Now it's uh, the big one that I go to. And I can't LA think Fitness? Of the damn name. No. Lifetime. Oh, Lifetime. Yeah. It used to be U.S. Women Fitness. Oh, I think you're thinking of the one in Golden Valley, right? Uh, or, um, I don't know. They have a few of them. Um, the one that my parents went to is bulldozed. Oh, really? They, yeah, they're like uh, warehouses now. Oh, geez. But anyway, so so they went there all the time, and there's a, um, you know, the kids' room where we could go and play, and they had people watching over us. And there's this little doll. I don't know why I liked her. Um, she kind of, what, what's that? Um, cutie pie, cute. Um, there's a, a treat with a little baby's face on it. Yeah. Kiwi, kiwi pie. Never heard of it. Oh, maybe it's a Japanese thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, okay. Anyways, this little baby doll looked just like that. Mm -hmm. And I just, every time we went, I would find it and play with it. Well, this one day my parents were picking me up and I was like, I'm going to take this home. Mm -hmm. And so I had it in my hand, like no one's business, you know, just whatever, walking out with it. And we get out to the parking lot. And again, my dad caught me. <laughs> um, and he says, what's that that you have in your hand? And I'm like, oh, it's a baby doll. And he's like, where'd you get that? Inside? <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> That's stealing. Inside. And again, I remember having this, oh, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he didn't ber berate me or anything. Like, it, it was just, he brought, he made me bring it back in. I said sorry. And I don't think I stole anything since, actually. <laughs> Good parenting. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you were, my, my question always is, though, is how, how much are you responsible for the ability to learn lessons? Mm -hmm. Like, you just learned right away. Okay. Like, you touch fire. Oh, it's hot. Yeah. I'm not going to do it anymore. Some people need to touch it a couple more times yeah. or they burn their fingers off or something. And it's so strange how we're all different like that. Mm -hmm. I learned the hard way, too. There was, <laughs> it's a little explicit, but it was fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Stellmacher, my teacher, I had a huge crush on her. <laughs> we were in the lunchroom, and people started passing around this rumor that this <laughs> girl was giving this kid a blow job oh no didn't know what that meant yeah right so all i did was i parroted it to my friend mm -hmm. i said i heard joe shannon give joey a blow job i don't mm -hmm. know and mm -hmm. i just kind of whatever and the person i told it to stood up walked right to the teacher and told her oh and so i got this the finger you know come here michael oh, yeah. and I'm like i didn't feel scared because i was like i don't know i didn't mm -hmm. say anything bad she takes me in the back office and asked me did you say this, you know? 
And do you know what that even means? And I remember just going, I felt so stupid because I was thinking, why did I tell everyone something I didn't understand, you know? Yeah. And the look on her face, she looked very disappointed. And after that, I think it taught me about not passing along lies if I don't mm. understand them myself. It was a really good lesson because people would still gossip in l- the lunchroom after that, and I never t- took part of it. So Good for you. Yeah, sometimes you lesson just... Lesson learned. Yeah, you don't know where you're going to learn your lessons, but they're yeah. usually painful. Yeah. That's why it's kind of funny when people don't want to let kids feel pain, because I think that's when you learn the most mm. for most people. You have to sort of feel... Oh, you're a dick. Well, you can't hang out with anybody. You got to yeah. be by yourself because that's what you're going to end up like anyway yeah. if you keep doing that. Tough love. Yeah, they might have to feel that. But it's like we want to nerf the world. So, mm. oh, don't touch the stove. Don't worry. It's not going to be hot because we we made it. We nerfed the stove. You know, I think that wouldn't be a good way to learn yeah. life. I'm I'm kind of I kind of go with the the tough love. You, you smack a kid once in a while, yeah. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> <Just> yeah, <laughs> but um, I mean, I have no kids, but. I definitely, I mean, I have 20 kids every year. I was going to say, yeah. 20 new kids every year. People but who give you shit about not having kids, you got to say, try my job for a couple days. <laughs> yeah. But is it, nah, it's too personal. I was going to say, is it getting ready for wanting to have kids or does it push you away from not wanting oh, to have kids? Oh, well, it's definitely good birth control. Oh, for sure? Oh my gosh, best. yes. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I love that answer. Like. I mean, at the same time, though, yes, it's it, it can be good birth control. Mm-hmm. And I swear they, they say teachers often have children later just yeah. because we don't, you know, if we start teaching right out of college, it's not like, oh, I want kids now. Like, you, you see kids every day. Right. <laughs> so that part of you, the void is, if you had the void, yeah. has been satiated for that long. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So when do teachers usually decide to f- finally go ahead and have kids? I don't even know. It's got to be an exact amount of time. 12 years. 12 years after you start teaching? That'd be too long, wouldn't it? I've been teaching for 13 years and oh, okay. <laughs> I have no kids. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, there is I'm that. Patient. There is that feeling of I see kids all the time. I yeah. got that. I have nephews and nieces <clears throat> too. So it kind of feels like, thanks everyone. You did the work for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, a- on the other hand... Um, it has also opened my eyes to the idea of adoption because I have seen, I've had some foster kids come through my classes and I've had some kids come through that really, <coughs> really um, needed a more loving home atmosphere um, where you're kind of like, oh, how do I say this? They don't seem very wanted at home Mm -hmm. um i had a situation where a boy uh recently lost his mother now his mother was actually his aunt okay i think his real mother was in prison um but he lost his mother uh, i'm gonna call her his mother um uh, suddenly and they had no other family members i think he was down in georgia or some, some some place south and no other family members to take care of him so uh they they flew him up to minnesota to where um her brother so his uncle okay. lives um so he was the next the next one in line okay. you know so he lived with his uncle and <clears throat> uh, he came to my class you know i think his mother died in the summer and he was with me in the fall oh. um came in oh my gosh just the most the sweetest boy just so bubbly and happy and when i heard what happened i'm like how is he how is he so happy and Mm. just so loving like he's the kind of kid that just wants to come and give you a hug and and then i saw it start slowly you know reality started slowly Mm -hmm. seeping into his His mind yeah and um he grew pretty angry you know i mean he he was uh grade two so seven years old he wasn't getting any um counseling or therapy um and at the same time um his uncle you know didn't really wasn't expecting a child and his uncle wasn't very engaged 
and <clears throat> we gave the kids a little homework i think like two worksheets a week or something like that mm -hmm. that was years ago mm -hmm. we don't really do that anymore <laughs> not that young but um anyways you know and so i'd ask him i say hey like you know you haven't brought any homework in two weeks what's going on and he's like m you know I, you know, I didn't know how to do it. And I was like, well, you know, you can tell me or tell your uncle. And, and he's like, I did tell him. And I'm like, well, what did he say? Well, he didn't want, he just, he was playing this PlayStation. He just didn't want to, he, he didn't help me. Mm -hmm. And it just broke my heart because I'm like, I mean, you know, his, his uncle wasn't expecting a child. At the same time, this, he lost his mother. Mm -hmm. And... I just, to see the way that he changed through that year just broke my heart. And it was one of those, I think all teachers have a few kids that they can think of where it was like, I just want to take you home. Mm -hmm. Like, and just, you know, you, you kind of know that they're struggling with something and you just want to help them. Yeah. And, and I couldn't, yeah. you know, and that's um, a big frustration with, with our education uh, system is that, it's hard to get these kids help, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, if there's a child that really needs like, uh, you know, special education services or support. Oh, there's a lot of paperwork, I bet. a lot of paperwork. I mean, it's, you know, and of, of course you don't want to just like say, Oh, I think this kid has this and we'll stamp him with that label. You know, we definitely, and I think that's part of, you know, all of the paperwork is, you know, they want to make sure that's not going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, all these kids are getting labeled, but, at the same time, there's a lot of kids that are getting zero support. They've got their classroom teacher. Uh, and we do our darndest, but, you know, we're not magic. Mm -hmm. And um, It's not like they're paying you a lot either uh, to do what you're doing, to yeah. take on that responsibility. Yeah. Either way, though, I mean, we try. But um, there's just so many kids that I can think of that it was like, I don't know how I can help you anymore. Like, yeah. I want to. There'd be a lot of kids that I, I, you know, like this, you know, we have a school therapist or counselor, but they're, they're over, overloaded with so many kids that need help I'm sure. for so many reasons. And, and it's, it's, it's so difficult to get the help that they need. We want to, but. Yeah. You almost have to just send them on their way and hope they figure yes. it out somehow. Just teach them that you care for them and. Yeah. Maybe if they just know somebody good. cares and they probably realize, or that, that kid probably realized his mom cared until she w wasn't able to. Yeah. If you would have said he was 16, I would have felt a lot better because at least in a couple of years he could go out on his own and do things. <clears> but yeah. ooh, that's yeah. a tough age I, to lose all that. He's one that I always, I, I wonder how he's doing. Yeah. You look him up on Facebook. He's <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not that creepy. <laughs> got some face tattoos no yeah. just kidding no you'd be surprised though a lot of people that i know who do really good things later on in life they had mm -hmm. the weirdest craziest <coughs> adversity growing mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and because they overcame it suddenly life doesn't seem as scary and they do great things you know? yeah sometimes not yeah. always yeah sometimes it's not a good story right of course you see that with kids that have everything too you know kids that have a lot of advantages oh yeah they just party their whole life and then you look what they're at today and you're like oh i thought you had rich parents oh mm -hmm. i guess that doesn't help all the time yep you know? no it rich parents the saddest thing i've ever run into as a teacher are kids that have rich parents that are always busy and they never t do anything for them so they throw money at them yeah. and these kids become almost like sociopath yes. sociopaths and I had this one kid come in. He was talking about how he's torturing a toad or something. Oh, no. That's really and bad. And I just kept looking at him like, are you really saying this with a straight face? You know, he yeah. took a lighter. What would you do? And he's like, yeah, it was so funny. Oh. Yeah. I was like, wow. And I had to show him that it was not right. I was yeah. like, that's terrible, man. I mean, like, don't you <clears throat> care about the toad? He's like, no, it's just a stupid toad. Oh. Like, that's what a sociopath would yes. say. You know? Yeah, that's, that's, tr that's a big problem when animals are being abused. Yeah. Wasn't that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's thing? He used to collect dead animals on the road and bring them oh. home and stuff. Yeah, probably something crazy like that. Yeah, if you study all the old serial killers, I bet yeah. you'd find some form of that or something. Mm -hmm. Or they have really twisted mm -hmm. sexual things, but that can mm -hmm. also be tied into that yeah. in a scary way. But yeah. I, uh, I mean, not to continue the kind of the sad 
not unhappy. I'm gonna put some sad conversation music behind, behind this part. <laughs> we'll drum it up. Um, <laughs> there, there is a book that uh, gave me a bit more insight to that kind of stuff. It was, it's called "The Boy That Was Raised as a Dog," mm. and it's written by a psychiatrist, and he, uh, it's stories about his clients, and I think were all of his clients children? I think they were all, yeah, they were all children. And yeah, the things that happen early on, you don't realize how much they can have an impact on a child later in their life, like the person that they end up being. Mm -hmm. Um, There was one story, I won't go into it, but um, basically um, the importance of coddling your your Mm -hmm. newborn baby the connection like, you create. Yeah, it like it's your brain development. Mm-hmm. S- like is a big part of that, you know, the first few weeks, the first year of being close and um comforted. I mean, your like f- your physical brain, the way that it grows, like it it um you know, it develops empathy. And that was a big piece. There was a story about a boy who um when he um I said I wasn't going to go into it. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, I'll it sounds go into interesting. It in general. Is this the um, dog he, one? The kid that was raised like a dog? Um, this was not. Which one was that? That was another one. But basically, when, when he was born, his mother, he was unexpected. Um, and um, his mom wasn't ready to raise a child. And I, she had other struggles. When he would cry, she would just leave him in the crib and leave for hours. And so he never felt the warmth Mm -hmm. of his mother. Um, No answers to his cry. Yeah. And um, he ended up, um, when he was a young teenager, doing some pretty horrible stuff. And uh, I I don't, they must have put him in juvenile prison. I mean, it was like for life kind of stuff. Whoa. Yeah. Was he killing people? Yeah. Okay. Just because no empathy, I mean, mm-hmm. you don't see that it's that wrong to do things, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so. ever, do you know anyone like that, where you wonder if they have no empathy? Because they say one out of 100 people. Yeah, do I know 100 people is the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you sitting across from me right now? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, really and truly, like, I, I try and I pick and choose my circle my circle is pretty big i mean i i when i find you know good people i love keeping them in my life um which is hard when you travel overseas and you work overseas so actually right now i'm i'm home for a few weeks and i'm like oh my gosh i need to get a hold of everyone (laughs) and every day it's like i have a lunch date i have a Mm. coffee date be sure you still have have a vacation you know, Say what? Hopefully, you still have a vacation somewhere. Yeah, uh, it last summer it didn't feel like that, but but I want to see everyone, yeah. and I still don't get to see everyone. There's still a lot of people that I don't even get to. Um, Just put everyone in one room and then walk by and say hi. And yeah. Then leave. <laughs> And go do what you really want to do. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Let's it's just good you want to see people. Well, you know who your true friends are, too, when you leave for a long time and you come back and they still want to see you yes, and talk and everything. For sure. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's hard, I think, to keep in touch anyways. You know, we get busy with our our work lives. and You mean in a deep way? Because you can always text somebody or yes. throw them a Facebook message, but that's kind of, I don't know, impersonal in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, though, I mean, I think of the people that used to work abroad or travel abroad before the internet. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, those people are amazing. <laughs> they didn't have Google Maps. They didn't have Marco Polo, like where you could like, or Skype, you know, yeah. they, they, they didn't have any of that. And they had scrolls and birds. They would just send it yeah, overseas. That's all they had. Yeah. But I mean, people sometimes are like, wow, that's so awesome that, you know, you must <clears throat> mi- miss home so much, which I do. But at the same time, it's um, the homesickness is eased by technology, you know, because yeah. I, you know, I can Skype and see my sister or my parents um, or my friends. And, um, you know, I mean, it's like you're, it's almost like you're in the same room with mm-hmm. them. It's only getting better. I mean, pretty soon you'll be able to put on, you probably can, a headset. They could put on a headset. You could choose a virtual room to sit in and mm-hmm. you can literally talk to them and reach out and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, it's all coming. It is. Who knew we would get to the Jetsons level in our age? We're getting there. Remember the TV would come down? And yes. That this, happens now. <laughs> yeah. You've got yeah, FaceTime and all that stuff. It's crazy. 
But I think that moving to China sounds like such a big thing, but you're right. At least you have a little bit of a connection at all times. Mm-hmm. Back in the old days, just moving a state away seemed forever. Yeah. Like, what? You're moving to Wisconsin? Yeah. We have Why to would you write, do that? Yeah, we have, to write, <laughs> <laughs> we have to write letters to each other. But I try to tell my students how weird the life was before cell phones and all yeah. that. And I sound like the old ancient man now, but it's like, yeah, we used to go to gigs the middle of December, and you didn't know if you broke down, if you would live or not. Because it'd be three in the morning, you're coming back from a gig in the middle of Wisconsin, it's mm-hmm. a blizzard out, you could just die. Yeah. And if your car broke down, you had to have blankets, yeah. and hope a semi truck goes by or something. Mm-hmm. Light a flare, I don't know. I, I, nobody I know ever had flares. But <laughs> that's so weird how far we've come with all that stuff. And it must be so, I mean, I can remember the first person that had a cell phone <laughs> was my... I want to say my junior or senior year in high school. And there was one girl in our class that had a cell phone. Was it huge? No, it was actually the Nokia ones. Oh, like those the, are sweet. Yeah. I miss those. Um, <clears throat> but I can remember thinking, why does she need that? Like, who's she going to call? Because <laughs> no one else had one. What is she, Maybe the her president or one. something? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's crazy how we're so, we have our phone on us and watches right that there between us right now do yeah. you have a watch do you have one of the fitbits or anything well it's a kind of a funny story i'll tell you about later but mm. i got one when the youtube channel took off i had some extra dough so i'm like bought all these guitars bought things i actually use you know mm. and i keep saying i said this in three podcasts now the apple watch was one step too far for me oh oh i think did you mention that one of your other podcasts yeah because it kept lighting okay. up yeah and i eventually I took it off. It was great to run with because I could wear my earbuds Uh and it would just send the music to it. I didn't have to have my phone on me. Mm -hmm. But then my friend Chris was looking for a phone at the time or a watch at the time. And I'm like, you just want to try mine? Mm Because this is, this thing's a leash, man. So sometimes it happens. That's kind of where I've I've drawn the line. Like I don't have a Fitbit. Um, I do, eh, at the same time, I do carry my phone with me because I want to know like how far I ran or what my pace was or, you know, if I'm on You're super healthy, so you need, you like numbers and stuff. I I do. Yeah. (laughs) On my bike, I used to have a, a, you know, a computer on it, the little speedometer because I loved to see how fast I was going. Okay. Very self-competitive. How fast? Well. How fast could I go? On a normal bike, what's the top speed people usually go? Well, I mean, I guess it, it depends. Like if you're on flat ground, like I could um, bike a bit just on flat ground, holding it 20 miles per hour. That's fast. Um, going down hills. I mean, so much fun, like 30 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but my favorite part um, with road biking is um, biking with traffic, mm. in traffic, mm. which you're most- one of, the, most, one of those people. Yeah, I am, but I am, I am, I stay on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, not in the, not in the, um, shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, on the shoulder, but what, what do you call like Curb? Like where, where all the water goes. Why am I not thinking of that? Sewer, sewer system? You know, like how they, it goes down a little. The curb. (laughs) Let me act it out. (laughs) Is it the curb? (laughs) No, not the curb. Like right next to the curb. Um, it'll come to me in about 20 minutes. The embankment? No, I don't know. Yeah, we'll go with embankment. Okay. Um, but anyways, like right next to, like, so I'll take Damn. up like half a half a lane. Okay. It depends. Like if it's a two lanes going one way, I'll take up like half a lane because people can go around. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm not on a freeway or anything. Sure. Um, I just saw a guy in front of me the other day. It was in Minneapolis. Decided to just take a driver driving lane, but he was going as slow as he could go. Oh, no. And I was thinking, am I an asshole for wanting to... I don't know. It was weird. It just seemed like you, you should at least get over a little bit. Yeah. Or Was it one lane? What's that? Was it one lane or two it, lanes? It was one lane, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was kind of like, dude. Yeah, you got to be cons- – I mean, both both ways, both the bikers and the drivers, we all need to be considerate, right? Yeah. Um, I guess. I, I, yeah, but I get my kicks from um, – my favorite part is – um, coming up to a red light and mm-hmm. there's a long line of cars waiting and then just as it hits green like i time it just right so i hit the intersection when it hits green and i just like fly down the road like Whoa. past all the you know past all the traffic everyone's stopped and pissed off and you're yeah. just are I'm you like, like those yeah. motorcyclists that go between cars and- um n- no i well when i was in minnesota no but in china did i do that 
I did that a little in China, but people, I mean, things are crazy in China. Not crazy like in India when you see the videos of like the crazy traffic. It's a little more orderly. Even in Italy, it was insane. Was Mopeds it? everywhere, people oh, yeah. driving in the circle. Nobody knows what's happening. Oh, no. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I'd get nervous going around one of those in a, on a pedal bike. But yeah, I bet. Yeah. Wait, so I'm scared now because yeah. you're saying as soon as the light turns green, you book through. Mm. Aren't you worried about someone um, trying to run? Yeah, I. I mean, I usually I'm I'm pretty aware of my surroundings. You're a f- former or present roller girl. Was it roller girl? Former. former. Yeah, roller girl. Which actually running, um, going through a green light without looking both ways. I've got a roller derby story, or not roller roller skating oh, no. story for that. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I I uh, played roller derby for a few years. Um, retired myself because I tore my ACL a third time. But Three once, times. yeah, once you're in roller derby, though, you never want to stop. Mm-hmm. So I still roller skate. And um, when I was living downtown Minneapolis, I would roller skate around again during traffic because <laughs> I love taking the the um, bike lanes and passing the traffic when they're all backed up. And I'm like, hee <laughs> I actually, one time I got a high five. Someone like their window, they rolled their window down. Yeah. It was on a one way. And I'm like, uh-oh. Like, as I'm about to pass, they roll their window down. And they put their hand out. They're like, yeah, high five. <laughs> you sure they weren't trying to slap you? <laughs> no, they weren't. Okay. They were happy. That's cool. But um, so anyways, um, my green light story. So I'm roller skating downtown. And I am pretty... I've always been a cautious person, but at the same time, I have a streak of aggression and com- com- competitiveness You're a wild. in myself. I can sense that. Um, so, what you know, I think part of what I liked about biking and roller skating downtown is you have to be so aware of everything. You basically have to assume no one can see you, right? And everyone's going to pull out in front of you or whatnot. So, I'm usually quite aware of. Looking both ways when it turns green, waiting for a second. I was uh, cr- trying to cross Hennepin at, I think it was like Hennepin and Ninth. Anyways, busy intersection. Mm. Um, and I'm sitting there, you know, on my toe stops, just waiting. It turns green. I didn't think to look left, but I started pushing off. So I started rolling into the first lane and someone they must have been speeding like 40 mm. 45 miles per hour you know downtown that they're kind of narrow roads yeah. um r- breezed right past me like i could have reached out and i would have broken my arm on it like it was so close and it was the way that my brain reacted to it it was like it all of a sudden was slow mo, and I can remember like looking as they passed, and I can remember someone leaning out the window and looking at me like it was all slow mo. Mm-hmm. They were probably going, "Oh shit!" And I was going, "What the?" Yeah. I was going, "What the fuck?" Did and you meet eyes? Did you make? Yeah. Eyes? Okay. Whoa. And I was just, I didn't know what to do, and I stood there, and I was, I, I had my thoughts. Like it wasn't even like, you know, people say your, your whole life flashes before you. All that, f- that, all that flashed before me was the oddest sense of loneliness. Like, it, I think it was just realizing that if I had pushed off just a little harder, I would have been dead. Mm-hmm. And I would have died alone on Hennepin mm. and Ninth. <laughs> And it was I. It was the oddest feeling, though. I mean, being that close and knowing that there was no way I would have lived through that. Yeah. Like I would have been. That would have been like one of those m- movie crashes where someone just boom and they're gone. Yeah. Whoa. And I felt so weird for the rest of the day. It really shook me. The whole day where you're like, I shouldn't be here right now. What yeah. if I did get hit and this is just a ghost? <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. Wow. So I was extra careful the rest of the day. But um, <laughs> but the next day, yeah. back to crazy. <laughs> so did you, okay, when you say lonely, was it because you had a flash? Was it the, one of the first flashes of mortality you ever had? Mm-hmm. It must have been. I mean, it like I, I felt like, am I going to cry? Like what, what is, like my... I didn't even know how to handle Mm -hmm. that moment. Um, But it was like the dying 
it, I guess it just seemed like such a lonely thing because you're going by yourself. I mean, you're, and of course, you know, no one was with me. Like yeah. I, it, no one there to say goodbye and just like poof, like, okay. I think um, that's something we have to face everybody, no matter how many kids you have, how many times you get married, how many family members are around you when you die. Mm -hmm. You still got to walk that hallway alone, I think, yeah. as far as I can see. And the funniest thing from what I've experienced through meditation, I'm, I told a story once where I came out of my body for a second <laughs> and I went back in. I won't get into it, but I feel like we will die alone, but the second you pass over you'll realize you're part of everything. So you'll never be lonely. You know what I mean? I hope so. Because <clears throat> as humans, we think of not being alone as another person being with you. Yeah. But imagine if you die and you realize, I was never apart from anybody ever. You know, It mm -hmm. always seems to be the point of awakening. Oh, I'm like you and you're me. Why would I hurt you? You know, you start to treat everyone yeah. like yourself, like it says in certain books. And then you go, okay, that's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. There's really no, there's, you can never be alone, but at the same time, ironically, everything's one so in a weird way you are alone but there's no such thing as you know there's a difference between loneliness and aloneness i don't know if you ever thought about the difference hmm. a, a lot of loneliness. my life i felt lonely yeah and then i got over that and i realized aloneness was a different feeling because it wasn't an urge to be around other people and mm -hmm. to try to pull everybody into my world so i didn't feel lonely because that's a very helpless mm -hmm. feeling but aloneness is different because that's almost a choice you make. Mm. It's kind of like when you're so busy, you just want to be by yourself for mm. a little while. Aloneness. And it's a good feeling when you don't have those voids. Yeah. Because filling voids, I think, can get you in a lot of trouble, even though we all constantly do it. Mm -hmm. Like, you ever wonder why you do certain things? And you look back to when you're a kid, you're like, oh, this kid said I could never roller roller skate. So that's why I did this. And mm -hmm. now I'm really great at it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever connect those dots? Like, why? Like, mm. Like, why did you want to? Play like roller derby? <laughs> Why do you like Zeppelin? What's that? <laughs> like back, oh, Led Zeppelin? Anything. Like, I heard you say Led Zeppelin. That got my attention. I almost wore my Zeppelin shirt, <laughs> but I thought that'd be so basic because I know <laughs> no, you like Zeppelin. You know? That would have been awesome. Yeah. So why, w why? Like, why do you, okay, we talked about this. I talked about this with Carrie. Mm -hmm. When you like a band mm -hmm. or you really love a certain movie style or something, can you trace it back to maybe the first time you saw a type mm -hmm. of music like that or heard it? And you were having a really good time. Maybe you were fishing with your dad or yeah. you're with your boyfriend for the first time or something. Yeah. And suddenly you love the cure because of that or something. Well, I know, mm, not sure exactly the, the specific order of it, but um, seventh grade, how did it go? My dad was kind of into documentaries and he liked to, you know, give us extra lessons at home. But I think, oh, was that how it started? Um, Mr. Lee in seventh grade said we need to do, needed to do a report on, I don't know if he just like left it open-ended, like something in history. <laughs> but, but either way, he, it was a report and I chose Woodstock. Mm -hmm. Because I, my parents had told some stories of when they were growing up in the 60s and um, they didn't go to Woodstock, unfortunately. I was always so sorry for them. Mm. <laughs> but, um, you know, they, they both left home. My dad was from Texas. My mom's from Minnesota. They both left home at an early age and um, went to Co Colorado. And um, at that time, Vail was a very, very small town. Were they total hippies? Oh, they were. Okay. I mean, they hitchhiked all over the country. And after he hearing little snippets of these stories when I was young, I was so envious. Yeah. Like, I was so jealous. I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> so when it came time to, like, you know, um, do a report on, oh, I wish I could remember what Mr. Lee wanted us to do it on, I chose Woodstock and um, found a, a documentary on it. And I was just so intrigued with the whole, all the, the music and just the the philosophy that everyone had and mm -hmm. um and it went from that to um um my dad showed me and my siblings uh, uh sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band mm -hmm. movie and that was really cool i was like i think i forget he used to play like abbey road and i was always like this is so dorky <laughs> but then he showed us that and i was like groovy yeah <laughs> 
there. That was your change right there. Yeah, yep. yeah. So then it went from that to me um, sifting through my my stepdad's. He had a big collection of CDs, really like great classic rock mm-hmm. collection. Great, I mean, no <coughs> records, all the Led Zeppelin albums, all CDs. Huh? No records, just CDs. No records, CDs. It's cool though. That was the cool thing at the time. Yeah. Ninety. Lasers Nine, playing music. Oh yeah. But um, then I found, I, I took some. I didn't steal it. I was going to say. I borrowed it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I took, was it Led Zeppelin 3? I can see the album cover. Is it a white cover? It has the little girl crawling on the rocks. Oh, House of the Holy. Yeah, I think that one, and then the one with the Zeppelin on the front. Mm. So there were two. And then also I I took Rolling Stones. I think it was Sticky Fingers. Damn, you had some good stuff yeah. right off the bat. And so I sat, I took those back to my dad's house, and I had a little boom box. And, of course, I was in seventh grade, so I shut myself in my room. And I was like, let's see what this is like. And, oh, my gosh, like right away I was like, this is fucking awesome. Wow. And then since my stepdad had such a collection, then I kind of, I, I mean, I listened, I kept those forever. Mm-hmm. I think I only gave it back to him like maybe five years ago. I was like, <laughs> sorry, Brian, here you go. <laughs> They're all scratched up. Yes. I played them a lot. Yeah, but um, that, so, so it's funny because some of the songs bring me right back to that moment. Um, what's the Rolling Stones, um, the rainbow song? Um, the one that go. I don't want to sing it. <laughs> a she one. comes in colors everywhere. Oh, yeah. She comes that was her hair. Hippie era, total yes. hippie era. Stones. And I. To this day, I love that that song. I could be in the worst mood, yep. and you could put it on, and I would just flip and just be so. She's a rainbow. Yes, yeah. I love that song so much. Everybody has to go through their Stones phase, where they sort of dip their toe, mm-hmm. and they got to find that one song that hooks you, and then you just stay stay with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was a kid, I bought "Tattoo You" at a garage sale. Oh yeah. So I have the record cassette tape. A uh, record. record. Ah. And I remember the front was the red side, the back was the green side. Yeah. And it was a really cool introduction to the Stones, but everyone needs their Beatles moment, too, and their mm-hmm. Zeppelin moment. Mm-hmm. It's the big three. Yeah. I'm sure there are more. You need the Doors, I think, too, yeah. a little bit. But doors, well, they're good. Um, I got into Fleetwood Mac yeah, a lot. A I, my mom loved Fleetwood Mac. Like, everyone had rumors back then, I believe, mm-hmm. the album. You had to have that. It was like a must-have. So Yeah. I heard they're still touring, even without they Lindsey Buckingham. They are, I heard. Oh, they're not touring with him? Maybe they worked out a deal, but I thought they replaced him with somebody. How can they do that? I know. <laughs> Just make it a Stevie Nicks solo tour. Let me double yeah. check that. Yeah. Have you ever seen any of those groups live? No. Um, what's the closest I've been? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't know, but can I tell you my first concert? Can I guess? Yes, please. New Kids on the Block. No, that would have been cool. Damn. I was too young for, like, I liked them, okay. but I was too young to go when they would be too So young. it must have been in sync. Oh, did we see them? They were, I loved them in high school. I um, still love them. Yeah. Justin Timberlake, he's great. Some um, people don't know he was in that band. I know. Is that weird? That's like Beyonce. Mm-hmm. She was in Destiny's Child. People, like, I've, I've asked some people, I'm like, uh, have you ever heard of Destiny's Child? No. I'm like, oh, you don't even know. So they've never heard Say My Name. That's like the biggest oh, song yes. ever. That's weird. Oh, my gosh. But yeah, you could tell in that band that she was going to be the star. It just, mm-hmm. I think she had to sell her soul to Satan to mm-hmm. get there. No offense, Something Beyonce, like but I, th- no. I, I do believe that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. Your so, first uh, concert. yeah, first concert, Puff Daddy. What? When he was Puff Daddy. Puff Daddy. No P. Diddy happening. Nope. Okay. Mace was there. Lil' Kim was there. Mm-hmm. Like, it was like, yeah. That's a big show now. If you look back, it's very nostalgic. And yeah. Very, those are huge, huge uh, influencers to what's mm-hmm. happening now. And when they were like, all the players in the house, raise your hands. I'm like, oh, I'm just a little white girl. But okay. <laughs> sure. Right here. That was a little uncomfortable. I, s- I one time stole a record. <laughs> I'm bad. I'm badass. Mm-hmm. No, what did you steal? A doll. Mm. I stole a doll once. I did. That's a crazy first concert. Yeah. Where was that at? That probably tar- uh, probably Target Center. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terrible, terrible, uh, terrible sound. Yeah, the there. sound gets cut up in the ceiling or something. Yeah. Weird things happen. But no, I haven't seen. I uh, I haven't seen 
any greats. Um, Stevie Wonder is at the at this point at the top of my list. I'm like, I need to see that man live. Are you saying before he dies? Yeah, kind of, because <laughs> it's like you know, all of these artists start going, and you're like, no, like That's don't, true. don't go. Yeah, you're only going to be able to see some of them through holograms, I think. Yeah, which you could see uh, Tupac now as a hologram. Really? Mm-hmm. Crazy. I know. They'll have actual concerts, and you buy tickets, and. They'll hologram him and they'll play Really? The music. They're yeah. doing that? Mm-hmm. Look it up. It's crazy. What happened when I was gone? <laughs> I know. Lots has happened. AI has, has taken changed. over. Yeah. <laughs> Robot Tupac. But uh, what's weird is I, was, I saw the stones, but the sad part is it was before I could appreciate them. Oh. So my mom bought us tickets to Bridges to Babylon, that mm-hmm. album. And I blew it. I didn't even care. I was oh. Like, oh, cool. That's Mick Jagger, I guess. You know? Yeah. But then I got to see uh, Page and Plant. They did this tour together where they did all this Middle Eastern cool sounding stuff, but it wasn't Zeppelin. What year was that? Ninety um, four, maybe. Okay. It was a long time ago. They have they they've hooked up since then, haven't they? They keep trying maybe to put Zeppelin back, but they. I think Plant has so much money that he doesn't mm. care, and it's going to take a lot to get him on stage with that band. That's no fair. Yeah. Because, you know, they could bring John Bonham's son up to play drums, and it would be very close. Right. Jason Bonham plays all the time. He yeah. plays in a band that plays Zeppelin songs. Really? Mm-hmm. God, I need it. If they ever show up in town, we got to go. Yes. Okay, Let gotta, me know. I will fly up. back from wherever yes. I'm at. <laughs> Are you planning on, you know, not to make you tell your old plans, but mm. China was a thing you always said you'd do or whatever, mm-hmm. but such a big jump. Is there another big jump you want to make or – well, I mean, China was kind of un, unplanned. I mean, I I grew up here. Yeah. Like I didn't, you know, I I went to Mexico twice, and I went to England once, and that was my um, all I had. And I know actually that's more than a lot of people. For sure, but, especially Minnesotans, um, they seem mm-hmm. to love to stay in this area. Mm-hmm. And I just got to a point, you know, I um, I had been teaching here for 10 years i had been living in minnesota same place for how old was i you know over 30 years over 30 years yeah that's right (laughs) i didn't know you were teaching for over 10 years yeah that's pretty cool yeah and um you know i mean it just it it was kind of like why i love minnesota i love my family and friends but why am i still why aren't i out doing other things or seeing other things you know like my family and friends, they're, they're not going anywhere, you know, for the most part, they're going to be here when I get back. And, um, so why wouldn't I do something else? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I'm just going to be in Minnesota my whole life, which again, love Minnesota, (laughs) but I mean, your spirit wanted to reach out a little bit. Yeah. And it was really, I, I didn't, it was kind of like a moment where I was like, okay, I've made my bis- my decision. I'm going to do something, you know, leave leave at least Minnesota. Um, and so at first I was trying to find teaching jobs in Central America, uh, Central America mm-hmm. or South America because I was like, you know what, it'd be great if I could be in a country where, where I could learn Spanish really well and just speak with the locals and then come back because I have a lot of, um, I worked in a school with a lot of Spanish-speaking families. Um, so I was like, that would be great. Well, I couldn't find a job at the time. Really? So I was like, you know what? I'll just open it up to the world. And China had a lot of, you know, teaching opportunities over there. So Did you kind of wonder at first, why is it so easy to get a job over there? Nah. Okay. I was just like, just, I'm like, just blow me somewhere, wind. Yeah. You know, just get me somewhere. I'm your dandelion. Yeah. Blow me around. You ended up in China. Mm-hmm. And teaching English at first or um, teaching grade one so I was working in an international school so it it's basically set up like a school here you know you got your grade one two three four five and um, each classroom teacher teaches math writing reading um, you know all the basics mm-hmm. um, and then you have your PE teacher and your art teacher um, so yeah I did that for two years and my contract was two years and I just kind of knew that that was my time that I was going to spend there and that I needed to go somewhere else after. Mm. But it wasn't time to come home yet. Okay. Only for the summer. Um, this is your journey. I yeah. love hearing it. Yeah. 
And so I, in January, I started looking for jobs and it took until May. I, I turned down a few offers for different reasons. They just, it wasn't right. But it took till May to, to find a good fit job. Mm -hmm. And so I was about to freak out because, you know, I didn't want to be coming home not knowing where I'd be next. Um, because then I'd probably just stay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Minnesota, it's so nice here. Yeah. Um, so I got a job in Singapore um, as a primary teacher in an international school. So Wow. Yeah. That's huge. So I don't, I, I mean, everyone I talk to that's been there or that knows someone there, they're like, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay. But I'll have to leave the chewing gum behind. Really? Because they, they have some very strict laws to keep it clean. Yeah, I heard it's and orderly. There, yeah. So no chewing gum, which I'm like, oh, that'll be good for my TMJ. <laughs> <laughs> I would have already pieced out of that because yeah. I'm addicted to Spry. But yeah. yeah. Um, TMJ out. Yeah, so that's what's next. And I guess I'm not really sure how that's going to look. Is that a couple year contract as well? Yep, okay. two years. It's a, it's a good amount of time to kind of plant your roots and mm-hmm. see and uproot if you have to. Or yeah. yeah. Would we'll it be see. the end of the world if you had to come back here? No, I just, you know, after China, I just, there was something in the air that said, you're not going home yet. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what it was. Like, I actually would have guessed, actually, before I left for China, you know, I had made the decision, but I was, I was scared because it was like, I don't want to go out there and like it so much that I don't come back Mm -hmm. or that I don't want to come back. Um, And I told my sister, I said, I'm only going to be gone for a year. I'm coming right back. And she's like, no, that's not how it works. (laughs) (laughs) You ever watch Cheers? Oh, a long time ago. When Shelley Long left, she's like, I'll be back in six months. Never came back. Well, wants to do a thing. That's you. You're Shelley Long. (laughs) So now you might find Singapore is even better and then never come home. Yeah, but I, anything's visit. possible. That's true. I mean, was that your first or second choice, or was that just a surprise? Singapore? Yeah. It was a surprise. Okay. Um, I actually, I applied everywhere. I applied Japan. Mm-hmm. Japan's a hard one. They, they don't, everyone wants to work there. I was going to say, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Dubai. Um, Dubai, that, mm-hmm. that'd be crazy. They have so much good jujitsu over there. Do they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shoot. They have a thing called Abu Dhabi where they bring all the best grapplers together. I think they still do it. And they get all the rich princes over there so they can afford to bring anybody they want. And it sounds a little scary. It sounds a little bit like Tokyo or something where Mm. you don't know, you don't really want to know what's going on there, but you know it's exciting and Mm. crazy. Mm. But you wouldn't want to know the CD underbelly of it, as far as I can tell. Wow. Yeah. But did you, you said you thought of Brazil or Central America? Um, You know, very weird. I, I don't know. I get these weird feelings and I just follow them. It's like I Central and South America seem too close to home. I think because really? it's connected. <laughs> Actually, technically it's not because of the canal, but yeah. it's you need pretty a, much. You need an ocean between you yeah. probably. Yeah, I don't know why because it's not necessarily closer. You know, like if I went down to the very southern tip of south america that's pretty far yeah but i don't know i guess i just was like i i need to stay f- what seems to be further away okay um you know don't get too close because then i'm just gonna go home i was gonna say it feels <laughs> like you're trying to cut off your training wheels and just or any ties that could bring you back easily and mm. just see how you do that's kind of a cool challenge a lot of people don't want to take that challenge yeah. it's sort of like telling you somebody to not even use their phone for a day they would freak yeah. out but you're like take my phone and throw it in the water yeah i don't want to even see it i might you might do have that, that challenge too <laughs> you're a lot like i me. do I like little challenges yeah like that, though. mine's like only eat this this week or mm-hmm. don't do this this week mm-hmm. but being in another country for two years that's a big one i guess that's a bigger challenge <laughs> although i could do that now because everything i do is online yeah. so as long as you there's should. internet i could yeah but i don't know i i feel like i do more inward journeys yeah because i've been to other countries and i loved it but i feel like i want to keep it as a vacation surprise so mm-hmm. if i go to france again i want to see like we visited the vatican once and it was mm. like whoa and our friend that lived there she was just like what it's just there's a castle over there. Oh, I forgot about that. I don't want to ever get that way with, mm, with foreign mm. countries. 
here I can take it take for granted whatever but when I'm in yeah. Italy I want to freak out when I see a vineyard or something and not habituate to yeah it. yeah I'll tell you something that I noticed about Minnesota when I came back like you know it's like oh yeah it's Minnesota can I guess like, real quick yes how green it is yes yeah did I tell you that before? No. Oh, my, my nephew moved to New Mexico, and he came back after a couple of years to visit. The first uh, thing he said was, "It's so green." Yes, everything's green. Those yeah. are my exact. Those I said, "It's so green and it smells so good." Yeah, like the air, and of course it's summertime. Sure. Winter time, I don't think you can really smell in that <laughs> cold. <laughs> you might be half dead in yes. winter time anyway. So yeah, but um, it smells great. And it looks great. I didn't think about the smell part of it. But yeah, yeah. they take care of things around here pretty well. Yeah. Depends where you are. If you're in Duluth, there's that paper mill. Oh, yep. It gets a little I weird. But that. Oh, my gosh. I was in a few states where we were on tour and I was like, is it this way all the time? <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, I don't know. It just smells like there's toxic waste somewhere, you know. Yeah. I felt kind of bad. But yeah, Minnesota's pretty clean. Mm. So the green, and then you feel like there's more oxygen or something because yeah. it's so green. Oh, it, it, I mean, it felt like it. Really? Like, I, I believe it. I mean, it, it, it just, yeah. Damn. Well, next time I go outside, I th- I'm going to take a drive soon. You ever drive to Taylor's Falls, that kind of area? You start going up north. Mm-hmm. Everything's trees for a long time, and you're just like, dang. Yeah. I was going to ask you really quick, did your parents ever hike through, like, the Appalachian Trails or anything Kind of the weird, not weird, I'm sorry, but the southern type stuff. No. They were more co- like northern hikers? Yeah. You mean like where where did they, tra- like where did they explore in the United States? Yeah, because States? they're both from like Minnesota yeah. and Texas, right? Yeah. Did they cover the middle ground or did they just go to Colorado? Colorado. Okay. I mean, it was all about the Rockies, the, the mountains. That's the place to go back then. My yeah. parents went there too. Did they? Yeah. Oh. I don't think weed was legal back then, but... N- no, but everyone did it anyway. I was going to say, that seemed to be the place to do it. <laughs> no no one thought about making it, ali- it illegal. They are probably like, what is that? Mm. Should we put that in the laws? Ex- yeah. It explains why it's legal there now, because everyone was doing it anyway. Yeah. Might as well make money off of doing that. Yeah. Hey, you've been out to Colorado, right? Well, I was a little kid, so I don't okay. remember oh, very much. Love the mountains. Yeah, my family, um, I come from a skiing family. and I was going to say Aspen and all that? Um, Aspen, I've never been to. Okay. Um, Copper Mountain... I, I've only been to a few steamboat, which is Colorado. My mom, my parents, I mean, of course, when they're younger hippies, they went everywhere and just the stories they have. Um, but yeah, the, the love of mountains is definitely in my blood. Really? Um, my favorite trip in the last two years when I've been abroad, Nepal. Mm-hmm. Like, I, yeah, it was just no words could explain like it could express just how awesome it was well you're gonna have to try it's oh, a podcast yes <laughs> use your words let me use my hands <laughs> oh Look like this it's beautiful um was the food like i imagine the food food was great interesting. Okay. yeah uh campman do was dusty i couldn't it, go there i would only think of bob seger screaming yeah. oh, Kathmandu the whole time. on the way in on the plane i'm looking down i'm going on to Catman. <laughs> I'm like, don't hum it. Don't you, you, hum it. You know who could sing that really well is Brian, knowing his yeah. voice, singing Catman. Oh, dude. Yeah. But yeah. Um, dusty. Uh, most A lot of people say, oh, it's dirty. But I'm like, you know, they might have some trash on the side. They do have trash. But um, what I, you know, it was like just dusty and hot mm-hmm. when I went. So then, it, you know, you're a little sweaty and then the wind picks up and then you've got all that dusty dirt on you Whoa. but but once i got out of katmandu um oh gosh let me tell you um the best bus ride of my life was in nepal nine hours old old coach bus so this is it has like the the fake leather seats that are cracking and mm. so it's like all like like an elementary school where it would yeah hurt, it would pinch just like you. yes pinch yeah. pinching and all that and Ugh. stuffy and everyone like everyone's packed in some people are even standing um nine hours mind you like people and this is like some people's commute and no no air conditioning yeah Ugh. well there may have been some on but i was towards the back so i didn't feel it um so nine hours going on roads that um 
maybe weren't paved like so imagine bouncing up and down um you know back and forth left and right um hairpin turns nine hours i started getting like motion sickness so i took um what is that medicine called um starts with a d yeah i know what you're talking about. i'm doing this a lot yeah. i like making you guess words <laughs> they both start with d too um well, I'll just say motion. I almost said Dimatap. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. No, I know what you. I know what you mean. Yeah. Dra- drama. Drama. Mean. Okay. Yes. Thank I you. swear to God, I did, it's somewhere. Yeah, in my I brain. know. It came to you. <laughs> All I gotta do is look at the Google screen, and I remember things. So I took Drama Mean, and I'm like, okay, I'll be fine. This is probably four hour, five hours in, but then it gave me a migraine, so I was like, fuck my life. Oh, that can do that. It w- I guess it did. I, oh. I I usually don't take that stuff, but. And uh, yeah, is but that how it cures you? It gives you a migraine, so you can only focus on that. Yeah, I don't know, but it was a terrible, <laughs> terrible bus ride. Did you throw up? I didn't. Okay. Um, so I held it all in. I, you know, but um, once I got there, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. But um, but it was worth it because I got to uh, see. Now I'm not going to remember any of the little town names, but got to a small town. I had. Um, a guide so he it was just him and I and um, we hiked about six hours a day Mm. so we get up at like seven o'clock have some um, you know rice and curry and get on our way and um, it was just it was beautiful I mean the rivers the 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 mountains of course the valleys um, there are a lot of goats I bet and they're just hanging out like hey (laughs) And uh, just so much, and it was just so peaceful. Um, We had pretty good weather. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You know when you're over there and the guy's like, we're going to have rice and curry for breakfast. Don't you go, isn't that kind of (laughs) generic? Like, why don't you have pizza or just something that would surprise me? Yeah. Or do you really want to get into their culture? No, I mean, that's what they they eat. They weren't making that for me. That was just what they served. Okay. Um, And now I can't remember what... um, there's a oh gosh I, it almost came to me there's a set dish that you'll find almost anywhere with like a rice curry and some vegetables and um my guide got it at every single stop really yeah Is lunch like or dinner or the whatever mcdonald's of that place yeah it's, just normal. it's good though you know like made from scratch of course okay um Sounds true healthy. true uh true i guess kind of indian food but not ne- nepalese curry yeah so um but it was just it was beautiful and nine days i did that for nine days so um we hiked out one way and um my the whole thing was great but if i had to choose a favorite part it was uh i think it's called kenan kenjin koopa ridge so we got to this little town and um my guide was like hey, you know, if you still have some energy in you, we can go up that ridge. And he's pointing up, and it's like, yeah, that's kind of high. And I'm like, how long will that take to get to the top? And he's like, mm, what did he say? Probably about two, I think he said an hour and a half, hour, half, hour, hour and a half up. And I'm like, mm, you know, okay, fine, let's do it. And so, you know, it was sunny out, the wind's blowing, it was, mm, probably 60s um pretty dry air and um as we're going up of course um he's like let me know if you start getting a headache or anything because at this altitude you can get altitude sickness sure. um you know so if you get start getting headaches or you're starting to feel lightheaded then you have to go down okay otherwise it can get really bad because you're getting way less oxygen yes there. Okay. and some people die, i mean people you know that go up everest can die from it you know if you ignore it so um so we're walking up and i mean we're it was a pretty steep ridge and i'm like thinking well i'm fit you know like (laughs) we've been hiking six hours a day and i you know i'm i work out every day you know normally and go biking and all that and i'll be fine no every about 10 feet i had to stop Mm. And catch my breath. And he was too. Because we were, it was such a steep ridge, and we were climbing elevation so quickly that it was like, oh my gosh. So it did take us a while to get to the top. But 
that was like a moment I'll never forget. Like, um, I, I, you had to watch your feet most of the time because you did not want to like slip and trip and fall down mm. the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had been watching my feet and I knew I was coming up to the, the top. And so I'm watching my feet and all of a sudden my, my view is of my feet. And then all of a sudden I look forward just a little and I'm looking down the other side. Mm. So it was like, I made it. And so then I look up to my left and, you know, you have your prayer flags, you know, hanging up, um, you know, um, on a pole and all you're surrounded by mountain peaks. Like you're, it's like you're eye to eye with them. And it was just, it was such a special moment in my life. I mean, it was something that I really wish I could give everyone that moment because it was just so awesome. And you had to earn it too by yeah having no oxygen. When you're climbing up though and you're looking at your feet, is that because if you took one wrong step, you could literally tumble back? It, it, yes. Jeez. I mean, you know, I mean, there was a, a small path. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you had to be aware. Um, but yeah, it was really cool. We stayed up there for just a little because it was so cold. Mm -hmm. Because the, the elevation, I think it was... 44, 4,400 meters. Whatever. I'm not really good with numbers, but I know that was it. I'm not good with meters. It's high. <laughs> high enough to get start getting really cold. Okay. So it was really cold and windy up there. So we stayed for maybe like 10, 10 minutes. But, you know, looking, the peaks were just beautiful. And then looking down, you could see in the valley the outline of the last glacier that pushed down in the sediments that it left. Whoa. Like it was so, it was so cool. I huh. just, there've, I've had some experiences like that where I'm like, I just, I wish I could put this in a bottle and mm -hmm. give it to everyone because that shouldn't be experienced by just a few people. Yeah. Like that's just, it was just so special. You know, if a pharmaceutical company could do it, they would. Yes. Sell it to everybody. <laughs> It'd we'd be very be, expensive. Though. We'd be <laughs> addicted to it. Yeah. I think, though, the catharsis of the moment, if I may use that word, mm -hmm. was because you worked so hard to get up there, you mm. experienced it, and then I bet you coming back down felt good because you knew you've seen, you've been to the peak, and now mm -hmm. it's just going to be downhill from there. Oh, yeah. It was nothing but good feelings. Okay. Yeah, it, I was just so, so filled up with happiness and Is that a good glee. rule, then, is to challenge yourself to the point where the payoff is worth it and if you never did anything like that your life would just be a straight line yes. or, okay that, I, that's kind of how my life was in sure. in minnesota yeah i get it you know i mean i was i was living a comfortable life you know i you're flatlining yeah and I, I it was fine you know it was shrug of the shoulders like this is fine yeah but it wasn't anything new and um you know nothing really challenging i guess I keep saying if you didn't have those knee problems, you probably would have gotten into jujitsu. I know it. <laughs> I still think about that sometimes. Because you have the spirit for it. Yeah. And you would have taught in Brazil. You would have got really good <laughs> at jujitsu. In, in my back. parallel, in the parallel universe. Yes. And you would have come back and kicked my ass, <laughs> even though I've been training forever. And you probably would have done an MMA fight. That You know, I, I have to say, yeah, it's in me because in college, I met a boxer and, and I got this idea. I'm like, that would be, I've never punched anyone. Mm -hmm. Have I? Oh, I, I punched someone in the shoulder. I should have punched him in the face. That's another story. Did you miss or did you No, I, okay. I, I, I shied away from it you because I was in public and I didn't want to get arrested, but he really, he deserved it. Mm -hmm. But um, so in college, um, yeah, I met a, met a boxer. And so I the, it got the thoughts going in my head. And I'm like, God, that would be so fun to like, fight <laughs> yeah but you know i've had i've had um a few concussions in my life and i take my brain very seriously and um i'm like i know you get a lot of headshots and mm -hmm. and while they might not be really big concussions i think they could have a negative effect on my my brain yeah it accumulates over time but a lot of people who get really good at Avoiding damage, mm -hmm. they last a lot longer. And they say a lot of CTE problems can be also in your DNA. So if you have a proclivity to towards getting it, you'll get it even with the slightest hit. Mm. Whereas there's people that get hit all their life, and at the end, they're fine. Yeah. It's a weird they thing. They are lucky. It's just in your genes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But boxing, I heard, is worse because they 
you get hit in the head constantly. Mm-hmm. In MMA, you might take a few shots and go down and tap out, but yeah. it's still you don't want your brain bouncing around like yeah, that. No. If you can have it, but I still see you because jujitsu you don't punch or kick. Mm-hmm. So you go in there, take someone down, put them, choke them out, and yeah. you win. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, you never choke somebody, huh? I'll teach you how to choke somebody. Yeah, way. all yeah. right. Because they don't die; they just you cut off the blood supply to their yeah. brain and they go to sleep. <laughs> just go to sleep. Yeah. Works against big people, too. You just have to have the right technique. Yeah. They'll run through you. Yeah. I, I'm not ruling it out. I mean, maybe someday. I mean, I did join roller derby after tearing my ACL twice. Mm-hmm. And my whole family's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I just want to do it. Living on the edge. Well, yes. you eventually stuck with it by sticking with the team, right? And you were mm. doing the mascot thing for a while. Yeah. Really it, cool. Um, it was difficult to let go of roller derby because... I played soccer my whole life, and I that was my identity, I and I that's loved where you it. Got your first two injuries. Yep, yeah. my first two ACL tears were my left. Soccer. Yeah, I made it thirteen years though. Jeez. In you know high competition type. Yeah. We have the same story basically. Uh, thirteen years jujitsu, and mm-hmm. then I had a guy. His name was Matt Byrne, which is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> he did this move, and my knee popped. And this was after about 13 years of training. Is that just a few years ago? It, yeah. And it was kind of depressing because I was finally got my next belt and I was ready to move forward and that happened. And I sort of lost the fire for it after that oh, because shoot. you get a little scared, you yeah. get a little tentative. But now it's back to normal. I didn't have to oh, go to the good. doctor or anything, which is kind of weird, but I'm stubborn. You healed but, yourself. <laughs> well, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't ACL, thank God, but yeah. it was... um pcl or something that oh, okay, can yeah. heal itself mm-hmm. and so i thought man if it's an acl and you can't even stand on your damn knee without yes. it buckling or whatever that's gotta be scary mm-hmm. what the first time it happened what was the deal oh gosh and it, you know you never have a good story for it yeah. like i've talked to other people that have and they're like oh my gosh i was just you know stepping off the curb um mine i was crossing the ball um i was playing right mid and crossing the ball like i had probably thousands of times before mm-hmm. and the angle that I hit the ground with my left lay w- w- with my left foot, the um, it all just added up the wrong way. You know the the power, the torque, whatever it was, Ooh, and the perfect storm. Yep, and it popped, mm. and I went down right away because I'm like, I've never heard that, and I held my knee, and um, that was my junior year in college. Um, I um, worked my ass off. That was in November. Worked my ass off all the rest of the the winter and then the summer, made it back for my senior year, um, and played my last year, and I was okay. But okay. you know, uh, of course, my coach was like, "Well, you're not the same player." But I'm like, I'm just getting back into it. Like, kind of like you said, like you kind of have that that you're trying to protect it still. Yeah, you know, it's still in your for head. A while, for sure. Yeah. So you know, it takes an athlete a bit to get over that you gotta be playing whatever it is or competing for a while before you get over it you gotta trust your body again which can be scary when you feel that first initial pop or whatever lets you down you're like that never happened before can i trust it ever again yeah Yeah. so then so that was number one number two was so finished my college career got out and started playing co-ed soccer now (laughs) I've got some teams. inner aggression, <laughs> and I like to uh, prove myself against men sometimes sure. because they j- some just don't really. They might look at me or other women, and they might just kind of like be like, eh, you know, whatever. I like to kind of take them out. Like, I play clean. I'm a clean player. But I, I just like to play really hard and prove myself. Sure. So we're playing co-ed. Kind of a friendly game, but, you know, it can be competitive. And this guy, like, he was just dinking around with the ball, like, showing off his, you know, his moves. And I'm like, nope, not happening. (laughs) And so I go, I tackled him pretty hard. But my, again, my left leg, I I planted it across my body and it popped. Damn. And again, like, right away I knew what it was this time. Re-injury. And we were playing indoor, so it was, like, in one of the domes. (laughs) The words that came out of my mouth, I'm not proud of, but they were echoing all the way across was because it? I was so pissed. Like, I was in pain, but I was more, I was so pissed because I was like, are you, are you fucking kidding yeah. me? 
but like that it was such a dumb thing like i didn't have to do that yeah but so you're mad at yourself more, i was or? so pissed yes okay. i was so pissed at myself and you know at that moment i knew i had to st- i had to retire myself from soccer completely mm-hmm. because i just had this aggression like that was too much for my knees to to handle yeah. you know like i just was crazy <laughs> all like over a, the place you're and like a race car driver that always red lines yes you can't let go of the pedal <laughs> i just can't not <laughs> where so, do you think that comes from i don't even know because i grew up a very quiet and you like your dad girl. which is interesting if you hated your dad i would understand you <laughs> if take i had out all these people yeah no <laughs> i i don't know um i don't know where that streak of aggression Did you ever have like a bully in school that no. was like a boy or something I, I mean i really kept to myself um i had a f- uh, i had a childhood friend that was she was unkind um i've never thought about her you know like and got angry and gone to play soccer and yeah. you know but so it wasn't in the conscious mind, yeah no um i i really couldn't tell you i think sometimes it's just in the genes yeah I don't know. Epigenetics, maybe some asshole beat beat you up in a former life or one of your relatives or something happened. Maybe. It's a weird idea that your relatives are still in you somehow and their fears and their whatever they have might still be triggered within you. You just Mm -hmm. have to turn on those genes. Yeah, there's something in there. You have warrior genes, I bet. That's why you want to fight. (laughs) There's something. That must be it. But you're using your warrior genes for good. Like you're scaling crazy mountains and you're you're touring the world. You're doing all sorts Mm. of stuff with it. But if it came down to it, I bet you'd be a hell of a fighter. (laughs) I I have to say, like, just with the soccer, like, I may have been very aggressive and, like, not angry, but, yeah, very aggressive. But I was always a clean player. Okay. Like, I was not one, you know, like – I I had I had the ability to be a very mean, destructive player, but I I loved playing by the rules and still kicking ass. Mm-hmm. Maybe pushing the barrier a little bit. Just a tiny, but well, look, that was the question I was going <laughs> to ask you. You said soccer, right? Yeah. But then you said tackle. So yeah. What is slide that all tackle. about? How do you slide do that? Tackle. So say it sounds you like know, rugby to me, <laughs> which is another thing you'd probably be good at. Yeah, I, I've considered it. Again, though, the well, although they don't get head injuries because yeah, that's another. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, where was I going? I know somebody Tackling. who does professional rugby if you ever want to get hooked yeah. up. Yeah, so <laughs> careful now. One game, sorry. <laughs> um, so slide tackling, you know, say your opponent gets the ball, they're dribbling away from you. Um, you can slide on the ground kind of like you would into first base. Ooh, into but, feet? But get the ball. Oh, so the rule is a lot of people will slide tackle and they'll swipe through with their foot and they'll catch the heels or, you know, and I've then they'll that. trip them and yeah. they get called for that. Is that when people fall down and overreact? Oh my gosh, don't get me started on okay. that. I can't watch men's soccer. Sorry, men. Yeah. But they I, flop like crazy and they're babies. It pains me to see that a little bit. Say what? It kind of pains me to see that. Yeah. It's embarrassing, isn't it? A little bit. Because yeah. you know they're acting to get the call, right? And they're terrible actors. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so if if you get the ball, you know, and you're not like cutting uh, cutting off their their ankles, okay. um, then it's fair. So I got really good at riding that line, like almost <laughs> not getting the ball, but I would always get a touch on the ball, and I had a good uh, uh, percentage of getting the ball away with slide tackles. Um, I had a lot of fun, like. Um, I, I lose the ball a lot, you know, because often in soccer, you, you, you're dribbling the ball, then you lose it. Yeah. Or, you know, someone might come in and bump me off the ball, which happened a lot because there were some bigger girls, mm-hmm. and I didn't really have much uh, weight to, to stand up, <laughs> to stay up. You're so often I actually, I, I, I was thrown to the ground a lot, <laughs> but I bounced right back up, mm-hmm. like, it was so fun for me to get knocked down, to bounce right back up, to to catch up to them, and to get the ball. <laughs> oh, to these big girls that are laboring <laughs> yeah, down the field. Yeah, because they weren't expecting me yeah. to come back and get the ball. Hmm. But that was that was, I was kind of stealthy in that way. Okay, I'm tracing your your aggression to possibly your stature, because you're. Oh, it might be. Yeah, you're yeah. like the little engine that could. Yes. You're tough. You have a 
smaller frame uh-huh. and you're around all these big girls and guys too mm-hmm. you're probably always fighting uphill yeah i think i might have um you got small prince, lady you got small prince lady syndrome. syndrome yeah but that's <laughs> a cool thing too though yeah because what's the opposite of that? Just rolling over and you know, yeah, just being weak. Yeah, I, I that's and that's why I can't stand s- watching men's. Guys I shouldn't say just men's. I'm. I know some of the women do it too. All but the highlights seem to be men, though. Ugh. But but it's like get your ass up and go and get the ball. Yeah, you fucked up and you lost the ball, or or he had a better move, or just. I I mean, grow up. Mm-hmm. I, I can. It drives me crazy, <laughs> crazy. Is it because of the way the rules are set? Because, you know, in basketball, they do that two fouls at the last minute of the game. Mm-hmm. You're like, he didn't even, he, he fell to the ground for no reason. Yeah, I think the rules tough. allow people to do this kind of weird mm-hmm. thing sometimes. They, they need to adjust the rules because I know in hockey, I think they call against flopping. Mm. I think they have the ref, if, if it's clear that the person is trying to, to get a penalty call. Yeah. Um, I think they get a, um, yeah, they go sit in the, the penalty box. The bad boy box. I think so. Oh, that sounds about right. Yeah. And and that shaped it up because I think for a while there, it wasn't so good. And they were, you know, getting the calls for stupid things like that. Football did the same thing for interference. All mm-hmm. those years, there was those weird interference non-calls and calls. Mm-hmm. And suddenly now you can see when someone acts like the guy hit the ball away, they have instant replay. You can't yeah. get away with that as much. But yeah. Jiu-Jitsu has the same stuff. You know, someone will do a move and they'll just go right to the edge of the rules. That's mm-hmm. why rules are very in- important sometimes to yeah. to have the, the refs or the whoever know exactly the line. Because mm-hmm. people will always try to push that border yeah. and see what they can get away with. So yeah, it's human nature, I yeah. think. Wow. I like that story about climbing the mountain. That's going to be a yeah. good one. Then if you don't mind me if I edit that out and publish that too. I sure. always do that. I'll take the whole thing. And then I'll do a little separate little clip if I think it's a really cool yeah, story or sure. something. Sweet. So next time we do this, do you think it'll be two years after Singapore? Probably. Or next summer. So one okay. year into Singapore. I come back stories. on the summers. Like you'd have an interesting podcast if you did the world traveler thing. Yeah. Did I tell you that? Or maybe you gave me that idea. Yeah. I've been, I, I'll take I've credit. thought about it. <laughs> 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 I thought about it back and forth but different topics like you know i'm like gosh i mean i could interview a lot of people from different places yeah. at the same time i'm like it would be really funny to do like more of like a dating mm, podcast that's right we talked about that i have so many damn stories mm. and i know other people have so many stories too dating around the world or something yeah, yeah. it's just people like, would want to hear that i bet yeah if there's some there's some podcasts. Actually, I tried um, listening to one that was kind of like that. It was like, I don't know what it was called, but it was about like dating and mm. uh, sex and all that was great it, stuff. Was it Guys We Fucked? That's a huge one. No. It's a great title. Is though. it? Yeah. Oh, is is it a good uh, podcast? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's two comedian girls and they talk about guys they, they've been with. So. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. No, the one that I was listening to, it was two girls, but it wasn't that one. Okay. And... It was really annoying to listen to. Mm. Their vo- something about the voices or like how they talk to each other. Like, I don't know what it was. Maybe there wasn't n- enough space in between them talking and maybe they're overlapping. Lot, yeah. But there was something that I'm like, I can't even listen to this. Yeah. Especially if it, all it is is crazy gabbing. No matter what, I've, I heard guys do this too. That's why I only have one person in my podcast. I told Carrie this too, the last guest. Mm-mm. You put another person in the room and suddenly the other people are starting to act for these people and they'll say something and look over like is that okay if they're like on a team or something mm. so I'm like oh you mean like if you're interviewing two people yeah like oh. if i have another person sitting there and you mm. you say something you sort of look over it's a cool oh, dynamic yeah. it's a different dynamic mm-hmm. and i'm sure i'll do it in the future but i like the the comfort and info you get from people when they're just one-on-one yeah groups of people to this day bother me i don't know mm. i like being in a band but sometimes i'm like i don't know like just the the dynamic, like how people change. It's you, you, every time you add another person, something changes. Yeah, it's really weird. That is weird. There's a hierarchy. About. If it's another guy, you're like sizing them up. <laughs> There's all this weird human DNA uh, stuff that happens. You know. Well, I remember there was one. Our hollow was it our Halloween gig? We had a Halloween gig, and I can remember afterwards. You're like, I'm sorry, that was weird, and I was like, what? You said something like, I don't know what the guys were saying mm-hmm. or what they did, but you're like. 
they're acting weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm thinking of it. I'm like, are they? Like, I, I mean, I wasn't paying attention. But sure. I don't remember that, but I that can was, uh, imagine. You dressed as a priest. Oh, the priest gig. Was Bobby a dog or a beaver or something? <laughs> remember? Was that? <laughs> I have a picture of it. I think he was like a, he was like a character in The Shining or something. It was Was creepy. it? Well. Wasn't the sh- there, I swear he dressed as an animal. Yeah. I picture him with paws on his hands, yes. but I don't think he did because he would. Maybe he, that was something, or maybe that was another Halloween. Okay, because I have a picture of us where you dressed as Sailor Moon or something. Um, oh shoot, uh, Sucker Punch. Sucker um, Punch yeah. girl, yeah, that's a good costume. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I think Nick was Where's Waldo. Yes. Yeah, we had a bunch of cool Aww. things going on. I think we had two Halloween shows because yeah. another one you dressed up as. We have a video of it. Oh, I need the video. I yeah. I can't find any of the videos, and I just, I those are such special times. Like I just, it was so cool to be a part of that the VFW man. Even the, it's funny that we kind of after a while I hated going there, yeah. but it was always a weird home for us. And then we had our final gig. You were already gone by then, but we mm. went. We played at this place that we always tried to play at. I can't remember the name of it now. It's funny, but of course it was the best gig ever. Mm-hmm. It was our last gig. We announced it. This is it. Mm. Michael, let's move into Texas. Yeah. We're just going to do this last show. And we had such a great show. The owner called the next day. He's like, can I talk you out of not, you know? Oh. Of, I'm like, yeah, we're done. I'm sorry. but uh, the Time has th- come. Yeah. Thanks for the last awesome goodbye. You know? So it was good. But then I had a birthday party last year and we did a little gathering. Yeah. You mentioned it to me. Together. I'm yeah, like, so. I can't get back from China. <laughs> yeah. Can you do via satellite? Yeah. Just put you on a laptop on yeah. stage or something like that. But yeah, if you're ever around when we do anything like that, I don't know if we ever will. Never mind. I don't think no. we're going to. Mm. But uh, yeah, that was a good time. Mm. Sometimes you just got to like remember and let it go. Yeah. Unfortunately. But you got so good so fast because you had to. Oh, thanks. You yeah. Well, I have to say, you all like believed in me when I was just like, really, you want me to sing backup vocals on this sing, <laughs> and you're gonna play acoustic and mandolin yes you learned mandolin was, in like two weeks it was yeah great. it was so fun it was just like just some something that most people don't get to experience mm-hmm. and i never i mean when i started guitar lessons i wasn't intending to join a band right. or be on stage mm. i just wanted to learn the guitar and then when you mentioned hey you want to be in the band i'm like that's crazy <laughs> And it was a good fit. I think it was good. Yeah, fit. We had a great. lot of different versions of the band. Uh, were you in the band at all when Chris was drumming? Was yes. A, okay. Yeah. Oh, I love Chris. Yeah. he's always, He was a good so vibe nice. to bring into the group. And it just it's cool to remember back from day one because it used to be a different band called mm-hmm. Joe's Wedding Band. Oh. <laughs> then it became something else and we just kept growing. And next thing you know, it's just like we we're – I think we hit the peak right when you were – yeah, a few months into when you were in the band, mm. like I would say. So, Yeah. It was fun. I will send you some videos. Yeah. I just have to find them. Good memories. For, for sure. sure. Just like you're climbing your mountains and stuff. Yeah. Like all the work you put into something and then it, there's the payoff and then there's the memory forever. Mm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think you get in trouble if you hang on to the memories too much because you live in the past. But yeah. I don't think you're like that. I yeah. Just you. just know they're there and that you had them. and um, Until you get Alzheimer's and forget them all. Yeah. But, you know. Fuck. But, which, which is probably coming my way. You think so? <laughs> my grandma hasn't. Well, technology might catch up. I'm I'm hoping so. I mean, the they're working on they're working on okay. trying to figure it out. At least we think they are. We're always <laughs> like, I'm sure there's a scientist somewhere working right? on something. Yeah. But then all the scientists are like, oh, those scientists are probably doing it, and there's then no a, one's doing it. <laughs> that's actually a phenomenon known as uh, I forgot the word, but they did an experiment where they had uh, what was it? It might not have been an experiment, but it was a real thing where there was an actual woman getting attacked on mm. the street and nobody called the cops because everybody assumed the other person did it so that's a that's good lesson terrible. it's a good lesson for us all like don't assume somebody else is doing it mm-hmm. the, kind of similar to what do they say there's a phrase like a well-watched pool mm-hmm. is the most dangerous like Ooh. so if you have like a lot of people around a pool and everyone's thinking the, the kids are being watched and then you know i mean drownings are quiet anyways you know you just go under and you you drown. Silent death. Um, that actually happened to me. Um, I was probably four, mm. five, maybe five. And it was a well-watched pool, 
many parents and adults around and kids in the pool and parents in the pool. And I'm walking down the steps and I step off the last, I didn't realize it went down again. And I went whoop. Whoa. Under, right over your head. R- went right okay. under. And then my sister was standing right there, luckily, pulled me out and I'm like coughing up water. No one knew. Yeah. My sister, I mean, I tell, I was just telling my sister this the other day. I'm like, you saved my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were joking and laughing about it, but like, seriously, like if she wasn't standing there, I probably would have drowned or would have had enough, you, you know, had brain damage. Right. Or, just being underwater for, and you're panicking, so you're inhaling the water mm-hmm. most likely once you start to drown. Mm-hmm. So you've been close to death a couple times. Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, a few times. I've been a few times. Uh, I probably have another story in there somewhere. I've been near death many times, but the one time that I almost drowned, it was a place called the Clay Hole in Coon Rapids, and it's this pit that they dug out for clay back in the day, Mm. and then some trucks got buried there, and there was like a toxic waste dump happening. Oh, no. And it filled with water, and us Coon Rapidians, we're already in a city called Coon Rapids, give me a break. We thought that was paradise because there was a little beach, and we all stood there by the water, and there's snapping turtles, but we thought it was heaven you know yeah. oh, we have our own little island here or whatever or our beach i yeah. should say and my mom would sunbathe and we would go out in the water <laughs> and all of a sudden one day i was about seven i think i don't know how old i was i stepped in a drop off because the water would just or the ground would just be oh. gone in certain places and i remember seeing the water go up and down like water bubbles come yeah. up as much <gasps> strength as i could muster oh, to get above the no. water because the for some reason i was being pushed out as i was doing all this too so i wasn't oh. getting any closer to the shore and i saw the scariest part that lonely thing you said mm-hmm. we all walk the lonely path of death i mm-hmm. guess once in a while <laughs> yeah maybe a few times i kept seeing my mom as i came up and oh. my brain was like help but I couldn't even <gasps> say it because yeah. I had no air. And my mom was just on the beach, do do do, you know, taking in the sun. And it was the weirdest feeling to know you're dying while your mom is oh in my total heaven just sunbathing. Yeah. You know? And then I just, I remember being really young, but I thought, okay, this is my last attempt. Because oh. I, you know, you know, when you're, when you work out and you have one push up left, that's all you have. That's mm. all I had. I already used up all my adrenaline. Went under. And as soon as my mouth was about to go under this gross, toxic water, Mm. probably explains a lot, um, (laughs) solid ground underneath me. And my head popped up over the water like a foot. Oh. It was like a weird miracle. And then I started just walking. And I'm like, please don't hit that drop off again. And I got got on the beach. I remember thinking, am I alive or did I just die? And I told my mom, she's just like, oh, quit going out so far. Oh, right. No (laughs) one even knew. Yeah, the the severity of it, she didn't understand it. She just thought, oh, whatever. You know, like she thought I was kind of being dramatic or something. But yeah, I still wonder if I died that day. Is this the the afterlife? I don't know. Maybe we both died. Was that on the same day? Ooh, I don't know. I didn't know we had similar (laughs) stories like that. Yeah. I also had a car almost hit me one time in Minneapolis. Really? Right in front of Chino Chino Latino. Oh. About to cross the road. Mm. And I remember these people next to us went, dude, aren't you pissed? Because the guy ran a red light. And I was just thinking, I don't know if I'm mad. What am I? Yeah. I think I'm happy to be alive, but I'm a little bit numb. Uh, yeah. It's a weird feeling. Com- there is, it is an, yeah, numb Uncomfortably feeling. numb is what, mm, what I Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, oh, by the way, I think I have a video somewhere of us playing Pink Floyd. Oh, oh that first song? Yeah. Oh, that, so. Was, that was so special. Okay, I'll send all that stuff to you. Yay. But till next time. Mm-hmm.